Thank you for having me here to talk about the current state of disaster robotics and what robots have achieved. Since 2001, robots have been reported and used by authorities in 47 disasters in 15 countries. And so today what I want to do is talk about disasters, but more specifically about how many times and where robots have been used, what they've been used for and what they could have been used for, why aren't they used more frequently, and my recommendations to get them used more frequently. But to begin with, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Of course, I'm a professor, I'm an academic researcher, but I've been involved in safety, security, and rescue robotics since 1995 and co-founded the IEEE Technical Committee on that. I've participated in 20 disasters in four countries, starting with the 9-11 World Trade Center. And I work at Texas A&M, which is not only a top university, but it is a leader in disaster practice and research. So let's get to the real issue. How many times have robots been used and where have they been used at? The sources for this material come from my book, Disaster Robotics, which details uh, the 34 disasters that have been reported since 2013. And also, I try to keep up with the different disasters at Crazar.org. Here's a quick view of how robots can be used. As you watch, notice that robots fall into three modalities, ground, aerial, and marine vehicles, and all three of which have been used in disasters. What you saw from the video was that disaster robotics concentrates on small systems for organic or tactical use, which means something that belongs to the people who are working directly in the field. They focus on mitigation response and initial recovery activities, which is performed by civil authorities and often requires engineering expertise, not humanitarian relief. So we're focused on the formal stakeholders. And a new area that's emerging is in medical disasters. But for now, we think of these as primarily meteorological, geological, and industrial accidents. As I've said earlier, robots have been used in 47 disasters in 15 countries. If we look closer, 
we can see that the order of frequency shows that the United States is led, followed by Japan, China, and Italy. It's also useful to think about what kinds of robots have been used. You can see that we started off with ground vehicles, but as the technology for small UAVs and for smaller marine vehicles became more prevalent, those have been added in a mix. And that started in 2005, which was Hurricane Katrina at the United States. So what have robots been used for? And what could they be used for? We've identified 13 missions that have been described in the literature from various researchers and from practitioners. Out of those 13, we see in boldface what's actually been demonstrated. Search, reconnaissance and mapping, rubble removal, structural inspection, victim recovery, estimating the debris volume and types, and directly intervening, which is to insert sensors or turn valves, which we saw at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. The rest have been talked about, in situ medical assessment and intervention, taking care of a victim who is trapped, being able to extract people from, say, a chemical spill, using robots as a mobile beacon or repeaters, a surrogate for a team member, being able to provide logistic support, and shoring up rubble. A lot of possibilities here for robots, so why aren't they being used more? If we go to a 2010 study that I did, you see there's an average of a 4.7 day delay in using robots. And this was taken from seven events with four, four countries with seven robots, three ground, one aerial, and three marine. What we see is that if an agency either owned an unmanned system or had an agreement with a partner agents, agency, the robot was deployed in less than a day or two robots were deployed within one day, which is what happened at the Deepwater Horizon where underwater operated vehicles are common in the oil and gas industry, so they immediately got those to the site. Now, if the agency has to determine that they need a robot, find it within the country, and then get it to the site, but it's still within the country, you see that it's taking between three and four days for it to arrive and get put into use. Unfortunately, if they have to go out of country, if they don't have strong interagency support, it shows up too late. It shows up nine days later. And if you think, remember your, your big time uh, for life saving is within the first 48 to 52 hours, your restoration of utilities and critical infrastructure should also be within the first week if you want to minimize the impact on the economy. So bringing things that can help with that is very challenging. And then if it's you're having to wait to get permissions such as flying UAVs or permission to enter the country, you see that that's an even longer delay. As a result, my personal recommendations are, first, create a technology-oriented United Nations Secretariat similar to the INSERAG, or make it part of INSERAG so you can create the appropriate policy and regulations for this technology to be shared worldwide. I think we should also create robot auxiliary teams that can join and participate with the INSERAG teams. I work with Roboticists Without Borders, which focus on training different industrial people, commercial practitioners to work directly with responders. And I think that all over the world they can create living caches of the constantly evolving best robots for teams to use. Remember, robots are like a cell phone or a laptop. They very quickly get technologically outdated. So it's hard to buy something and not have to 
uh, upgrade it within five years, constantly replace it. And of course, most agencies buy on a 10 to 30 year plan for major equipment. And then the final suggestion is to use my center, the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescues, existing responder training and train people in awareness of what these systems can do so that the agencies, their managers, the task force leads, leads can understand what these systems can do, what it means for them and the impact on their socio-technical systems, and also then train on particular missions, providing best practices trainings for responders. Since we are in Japan, I want to end with one of the highlights of my professional career. We are proud to have assisted our colleagues at the International Rescue Systems Institute with recovery operations after the tsunami. Dr. Satoshi Tadokoro can tell you more about our missions together. Thank you, and I applaud your efforts in changing the world and sharing your vision of how technology can help.